Hi, I'm Officer Korn. Uh, I'm with the United States Park Police. As I put on my little title, you can probably see at the bottom of my screen. Um, so I kind of thought of a couple different topics we could talk about. Um, and I was racking my brain, but I really think the best kind of discussion we can have with the youth is where it's youth led and they ask us the questions that they want answered. So instead of bombarding you guys with a bunch of information, this is really gonna be guided by you guys. And I hope that you brought to the table some, some questions that we can hopefully answer. We may not have all of the answers, but we'll do our best to answer them. Again, like I said, I'm Officer Korn with US Park Police, a little bit about myself. I'm originally from the Tennessee area. Um, 15 years total of law enforcement, both locally and federal. Um, let's see. I'm a father of two and, sorry, I lost my notes. Father of two and I'm a youth mentor. So if somebody else wants to introduce themselves. <laughs> I guess I'll go. Uh, how's everyone doing? I'm Deputy Austin Watson with Rutherford County. Um, I'm from the Tennessee area. I live here in Murfreesboro. I'm just your regular patrol guy. That's kind of what I do. I'm married to my wife and we have a little cat. If you can see him in the back above my shoulder. Um, that's just a little bit about myself. Hey, I'll jump in here. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Daniel Francis and I'm with the Chattanooga Police Department. I was born and raised here in Chattanooga. I have 14 years of law enforcement experience. I am married. My wife and I have five kids with a sixth kid on the way in June. Uh, we live on 22 acres just outside the city. We have, I think, eight goats, a cow, two horses, and 40 chickens. Uh, so I, I jokingly tell people I, I pretty much come to work, spend time with my family, and go to church, and that is about the extent of uh, what I do. My name is Craig Haney and I, I have um, been there about six years full time. Um, I'm married, have two grown kids, just got my first grandchild back in October. So we're pretty excited about that. And um, I'm looking forward to joining this tonight. It's hard to follow up Lieutenant Francis, but my name is Dana Vaughn. I'm an assistant chief at the Chattanooga Police Department. I have 26 years of law enforcement experience with Chattanooga. Uh, I've been there my entire career. I'm married with two grown kids and in our spare time, we love to camp and hike and do anything outdoors. Thanks for having us here. Hey y'all, I'm uh, Jennifer Sullivan. I'm with the Signal Mountain Police Department. I've been there almost two years. Before that, I was a probation officer with state probation. Lived in Chattanooga my whole life and thanks for having me. Okay, I'll I'll go. Um, I am Rachel Kreider. My, I, my nickname is Annie. I'm actually related to Officer Korn. He is my little brother. We used to work at Red Bank Police Department together. Um, now I'm at CPD. Uh, I have 10 years of law enforcement experience, um, five years at CPD. I work in the Real-Time Intelligence Center. I am married also to an officer of CPD. I have a nine-month-old baby and two stepchildren, one of which is a 23-year-old stepchild. Um, he also works for law enforcement, and um, I'm happy to be here. Let everybody go at once. <laughs> I think Special Agent Gordy is having trouble with his. There we go. Now you're <laughs> unmuted. 
Uh, my name is Stephen Gordy. I'm a special agent with ATF in Chattanooga. I'm starting my 20th year with ATF. Um, I have a daughter. She's in college. I just had dinner with her. And so I've stopped in a lovely church parking lot on my way back home. <laughs> I think we did. Did we get everyone? I think that's all of the law enforcement that's on here. Yes. Okay. Okay. If we I'm, not, this, I'm not law enforcement. I just happen to be here. So that is my husband and he is the other co-founder of Rise Up Cooperative. And one thing that I didn't mention when I started this was a little bit about my background and I am not in law enforcement. That's why all of you guys are here. Thank you so much. My background's in social services. Um, my husband and I have six children. We adopted three of them from foster care and um, Officer Korn and Officer Kreider are actually my siblings as well. They're my sister and brother. So if you guys see a big blue van, um, don't pull me over, please. Anyway, I would like to turn it back over to Officer Korn. Um, and if you want to ask the kids if they have questions or however you want to go ahead and start this, I'm gonna remute myself. All right, like I said before, I really think that this should be youth led. Um, I mean, too often, I think that, you know, us being officers, people uh, in positions of power or authority or however you want to look at it, um, we're usually telling people how, you know, the information that they, we think they need to know. So I think that it's important for the youth to come at us with the questions that they want to know. So uh, is there anybody out there that has any burning questions that they want to ask law enforcement or any questions um, about anybody in particular that you uh, you heard our introductions. If you have a specific question, don't be afraid to ask a specific person. I have a question about, um, it's more of drive in law, driving in laws. Um, and I know that it's not good to speed, especially, to, um, but I've also heard other things and from people about it's okay to speed at a certain amount. And I've also learned that um, a lot of some, some law enforcement is discretionary based off the officer and how they perceive um, the law and the situation. And um, how, what, at what point would you pull over someone? If they're going five over, would you pull them over? Or would you um, pull them over if they are um, going faster or slower? And just what do you see as a discretionary point to pull someone over for a traffic violation, especially speeding? Okay, so I guess I'll answer that. Um... And then maybe somebody else can uh, give their input. I'm in California, so uh, Katie, I know you, you're in the Chattanooga area, so you probably don't have to worry about me. Um, <laughs> but it really has to do with the environment. Is it raining? Uh, is it a sunny day? How fast are you going over the speed limit? What's the traffic conditions? Uh, how many cars are out? Are there pedestrians? Really, the good uh, rule of thumb is to look at those little rectangular signs that give you a speed limit and try to do the best at sticking to that. <laughs> if anybody else has any other guidance. My rule of thumb once upon a time, it's been a while since I've been in patrol. If you were going 15 miles over the speed limit, you got pulled over. And if you were doing 15 miles over the speed limit, you typically got a ticket. So, but that's, that's my personal preference. That was my, that was my cutoff. So. I know for me, um, it, it was situational, uh, much like Officer Corn just stated, um, when you're looking at things like school zones, something like that, five miles an hour is, is a much bigger deal than maybe down a main road um, that's, that's well-traveled and all cars are going the same direction. Generally, my rule of thumb was around 10 miles over. I would pull you over up on the interstate. If you were 15 over, uh, I would definitely pull you over up there uh, for that.
Okay. Does anybody else have any other input on that or are there any other questions? Feel free to jump in. It's an open discussion. I have a spinoff on that question that I'm sure the kids haven't thought about, but will eventually. If they were speeding and they got a ticket, what happens next? Because I'm sure that most of them are just starting to drive or haven't yet started and they don't know. Again, I think most of our youth are probably going to be uh, in the Chattanooga area. If you're not, uh, please speak up. So <laughs> maybe CPD would be better to answer that question because California is a whole nother ball game. So. You want to take that one, Lieutenant Francis? Sure. Say, uh, for me personally growing up, I would have been more afraid of my father than I would have been the court system, but that, that's just my situation. Um, uh, what, what oftentimes happen is you'll be issued a ticket, most likely to city court. And unless there was an accident or a lack of insurance or some other reason why it wouldn't go to city court, but here for us locally, it goes to city court and you have to make an appearance if you are um, 16 or 17, or there are certain other offenses in which you are required to make an appearance as well. Uh, then if you have to make an appearance, you'll, you'll go before the judge, he'll call you up and uh, you'll discuss what happened. He'll read the back of the ticket. And then you have the option of either pleading guilty there or requesting that the officer come to court uh, on our city court tickets, the officer won't appear on the first setting, but you can request that the officer be at court and the officer can testify um, to, basically he'll testify to the exact same thing that he wrote on the back of the ticket, which is what he saw and why he pulled you over. And then the judge makes the determination whether or not uh, you're going to be found guilty for that. And then on a speeding violation in particular, the judge also has guidelines that he has to follow but he will determine what the, I guess, so-called punishment would be uh, for that offense if you are found guilty. Thank you. And to add to that, um, if, you're, if you're in Judge Russell Bean's courtroom, he loves to send teenagers to defensive driving school. Um, he has a, a passion for keeping teenage drivers safe. Um, so typ typically, if you're in Judge Bean's courtroom, he'll assign you to defensive driving, and then you complete that course and bring the certificate back to city court. And if you haven't had any more infractions in whatever period he decides, six months to a year, then the ticket typically gets dismissed from your record. So drive safely. Um, if I could also I can... add to that, um, I'm sorry, I might have cut somebody no. off. So uh, if I could no, just no. add to that also, I think in most jurisdictions, uh, there's also going to be, uh, I know there was when I was in Tennessee, there was a point system. There's something similar here in California. So just keep in mind that you can't continue to get tickets. Eventually, uh, if you get to a certain point value, uh, your license will be taken away. So that's something to think about as, as well. Officer Kreider, did you have something to add? Uh, sorry, yes, I thought I was talking. Um, I know that most of you guys are probably too young to worry about this. However, um, in my career, I've, I've seen a lot of um, older teenagers and young college students that were in the car with somebody driving. You know, when you're young, you, you want to be friends with everybody and you, you don't really stop to think about what they may be into. And if you get pulled over or not you per se, but like somebody else driving and the police officer finds any kind of drugs in the vehicle, um, you have a very good chance of losing your federal um, student aid because of that. Uh, a lot of kids didn't realize that in my career and it, it, it's heartbreaking because, you know, I had to get federal loans and I know that most Americans have to and just be very aware of who you get in the car with if they have a little bit of marijuana that could cost you your college career if you don't have means to pay for it. So just keep that in mind. Thank you. That's a really good point, Annie. Um, 
if anybody doesn't have anything to add to that, uh, are there any other questions from any of our youth um, that you might want to have answered? Are there any I... questions? Oh, Go ahead. Are there certain questions they ask you when they pull you over and certain ways to answer them? That's a great question. Haley was a little um, soft-spoken just then, but she asked if there are certain questions that are asked when you're pulled over and if there's a certain way you could or should answer them. I know for me, um, I think that it, again, it's gonna be situational. Uh, each, each traffic stop, we like to say there's no routine traffic stop and that there's nothing further than the truth. Each traffic stop is gonna be different along with the circumstances. So uh, if I could give you any advice, um, it would be to answer each question honestly. If you're being honest and you have nothing to hide, then you have nothing to worry about. And I'll piggyback on that. Um, most traffic stops is most times officers ask for your license, registration and insurance. And they're probably gonna talk to you, try to keep you calm. Just answer the questions that they ask, answer them truthfully, you know. There's, there's nothing wrong. Most of the times we try to feel at ease with y'all. Hey, where are you coming from? Where are you headed to? Just keep that conversation, that dialogue, and it makes it easier for you and the officer as well. I know uh, for me, I would like, I normally approach the vehicle and would introduce myself. So it would go something like, hi, I'm Lieutenant Francis with the Chattanooga Police Department. The reason I pulled you over was, and then I would state the reason why I pulled you over. And that way we, we both kind of knew why we were there. And uh, I might ask you if there was any legal reason why you were doing what you were doing. One night, for example, I approached the car and said just that a guy had run a red light. And then he looked at me and said, well, yeah, I ran the red light because my wife is in labor. I was like, well, then why on earth are you, why are we on the side of the road talking? You need to get to the hospital now. I don't want to deliver this baby here. And, uh, and so I, I let him go and he got to the hospital. Uh, but I would ask if there's any justification for why you were doing what you were doing. And then uh, just like the other officer said, I would ask for your documents, your vehicle registration, your insurance card, and your, and your driver's license. Uh, and then from there, uh, I go back to my vehicle and look up all the information. Uh, generally, if, if you're from the state of Tennessee and I run your information, I can then see your driving record if you've had any accidents or speeding tickets or anything like that. Uh, and then, you know, coupled with whatever the offense was, make the determination whether or not a citation would be issued or if it would just be a warning, uh, come back up to the vehicle. I always appreciated someone who was honest, um, someone who's respectful, but also had a good sense of humor about what was going on. Uh, and really honesty is, is a huge part. And that, that's, that's very hard for some people to admit when they made a mistake or they knowingly did something they shouldn't to just say, I shouldn't have done that, I'm sorry. Um, for me, that went a very long ways, uh, especially if we were dealing with really minor infractions. I think to piggyback that, is there any actions that put you guys on more guard or more like make it less routine or is there something that can really raise flags quickly and it would be an innocent thing that possibly just happened or, or you know, down the path of how you answer or things in that path, you know, to take you off guard or put you on guard maybe even in that sense. Um, for me, honestly, like if somebody starts fumbling and acting like they're lying to me um you can you know we're we're trained to tell when people are lying and you know if they're diverting their eyes quite a bit and looking around and their hearts racing um just if you're really anxious that that kind of puts me off guard especially as a female officer um maybe not so much with teenagers but like I said, we're very good at knowing when somebody is lying or fibbing to us. So if you get pulled over, just be honest, be like, yeah, like I ran the, I ran the stop sign. I thought I could make it. I didn't know you were there. I know better. If you're honest with me, at least, um, I will almost always give you a warning. Um, but when you start lying and acting, um, like something else is going on, that's a red flag for me.
You mentioned a warning. What is the difference between a warning and a ticket and how does that affect, does it affect the point system that you were referring to earlier? Now, I know these things, I'm playing dumb, just to let you know, <laughs> for the kids sake. Um, a warning is just a warning. I, I believe I've been, in, I'm in Arctic right now, so I'm not writing many tickets, but I think that a warning is still electronic, like it is uh, noted down. However, it's not actually a ticket. It's just somewhere, I guess, in the cloud per se, that you got a warning on such and such day mm -hmm. for doing something, but it's not a ticket and a ticket is a ticket. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Ellie, you have Aries in your hand. Do you guys ever use like your badge, like your cop badge to get any like freebies or perks like at a gas station or something? I, I can talk about that. So in a uh, short answer, uh, have I ever intentionally used my badge to get say a free cup of coffee? No, but speaking truthfully, have, have I ever received free coffee? Uh, yes, but anything more than coffee, I would turn down because it's just not ethical. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, she's not my daughter. She very much is, sorry about that. <laughs> All right, are there any other questions, Blake? Well, I was gonna, I was gonna follow up on a question, Ali. So, why do you think businesses give police officers discounts? Because their job is hard and they do a lot for the community. That's one option. The other option, if I'm a business owner and I'm worried about being a victim of crime, do I not want police cars and guys in uniform standing around eating free donuts and drinking coffee in the lobby of my store? So businesses do that as an incentive to get, quite honestly, free security guards. It's very smart. You so, I know, have a yeah, so you all know why cops love donuts, don't you? <laughs> the same reason everybody else does, they're delicious. I have a question for the kids. Is there anybody on that is thinking about law enforcement or federal law enforcement for their career? I um, personally have t thought about law enforcement and um, specifically the FBI, um, but I'm leaning more towards the, um, the court system than um, the law enforcement side of it. Um, more um, being a lawyer, uh, prosecuting the lawyer, um, than that, um, just because I've talked to different officers and um, agents and just decided that that was probably the best path for me. AKA her family said, you're not gonna be a law enforcement because we already have three or four of them in it and you're not doing that. A lawyer is a better route. Well, the district attorneys are like our brothers and sisters too. That's, that's a, a very noble profession and I would be proud of her if she did it. I, I would definitely agree with uh, what Officer Crider, investigator, excuse me, investigator Crider just said. Uh, yeah, I would definitely go that route, Katie. I think Blake had a question. Uh, yeah, um, I was wondering, um, going back to Officer Crider's um, point, she said that you guys are trained to know if someone's lying from like, racing heartbeats and stuff, but um, how do you know if they're lying or if they're just nervous from a racing heartbeat? Um, well, I'm sure that most of the people on this have taken um, classes to teach them, but there's there's different ways that people move their eyes. There's different, um, there's, there's giveaways. For example, if I was like, if I asked you as a police officer and I stopped you, are there drugs in the car? Um, you would immediately, like it's human nature. Like if you had drugs in your glove box, for example, you would look over at your glove box. Not always, but uh, most of the time in my experience. Uh, you, people get really nervous when they're lying. People get a little nervous around police officers, but we're usually pretty good about um, 
calming you guys down, talking to people. It's hard to explain. Maybe uh, Lieutenant Francis could do better at explaining how we are able to tell if people are lying. Blake, I'll, I'll see if I can't answer this one for you. So when the officer on a traffic stop is coming up to you and asking your, your name, your date of birth, even when maybe you've given him your driver's license, your address, who's the car registered to, where you're going, where you're coming from, he's, he's creating a baseline of how, how you're communicating. And that's gonna be a lot of things, verbal, nonverbal communication. You know, your friends and family know how you communicate and so I'm sure you've got that, hopefully that person in your life that when you lie to them, they can just call it like that. Maybe, maybe it's a mom or a dad or a grandparent, but for the law enforcement, we have to kind of get to know the person and have a conversation in longer interviews. We call it rapport on a traffic stop. It's the same thing, just um, done much quicker. And so once we figure out those non-threatening basic questions and kind of see where you are, then when we start asking deeper probing questions, our body can't help um, but give away some nonverbal and some verbal changes when we're not telling the truth. Um, I have another question. We've been talking a lot about traffic stops and traffic violations. I was wondering if there's any reason you would stop someone on the street, um, not in a car, just walking. Um, is there any behavior that you would deem suspicious or um, probable cause or um, reason, uh, reasonable suspicion to stop someone on the street? Okay, I'll take that one. It, or somebody else can go if they wanted to. I think Craig was trying to, but he was still on mute. Oh, I'm muted now. Yep, there you go. Good. Thank you. Uh, we run into that a lot on the university campus because we have we have a lot of um, it's an open campus, so anyone can walk across our campus. So depending on what time of the day it is, if it's later in the evening and we someone see someone that doesn't fit the description of what we would consider a typical college age student. Uh, it could be someone that we know that's a transient in the area. Um, they may be walking down the sidewalk, slowly looking in cars. When they do that, that sets off a red flag. It makes us wonder what they're actually looking for. So generally we'll get out with them, uh, talk to them, identify them, uh, see if we've ever been out with them uh, in our system, check and see if they have any uh, warrants or anything like that throughout the city. So. Something like that, and again, it just depends upon the situation, the time of day. Um, we get a lot of people that like to walk across campus and jiggle car handles and look in windows for something that they can quickly steal. So that's something that, that would be a reason for us to get out with someone that's just walking. If I could piggyback on that also, uh, I think it goes along with the environments we work as, as beat officers or investigators or whatever your title might be, we all have our areas that we work and we work them quite a bit. Um, here in San Francisco, there's each month, uh, there's approximately 30,000 uh, car break-ins a day. Um, it, it's The city is, is rampant um, with car break-ins. So we know what to look for from time and time again of dealing with the same problem over and over again. It's usually a car with two plus occupants that will back into a parking spot after they've already made a run through. If we see that, we pay a little bit more attention to them. Or if somebody is looking around in the parking lot, not really doing anything, and they're on their phone, then they're a lookout. So that's stuff that we look for. And we might get out with them because of that. I have a question. What do movies and TV shows get wrong and right about police work? They get everything wrong. <laughs> um, I was on one of these about a month ago for a different group. And I said that probably the most close um, law enforcement or cop show would probably be end to watch except the end of it. Just the camaraderie of the two people, the best friends, the family. And when I say family, family of the law enforcement, like 
probably a movie that nobody's seen of the children that is because it's I think it's probably rated R but one day when you guys are older you should watch it um that would probably be in my opinion the closest besides the end because the end is tragic um to law enforcement I think they're on point with the donuts. I think Lieutenant Francis would agree with me on that. <laughs> we rarely, rarely, rarely ever saw the crime in an hour. So. I bet it's a good day when you do though. Yes. <laughs> and I know on most of those shows that we watch, I know we see all the technology they have and how quickly they solve a crime and we all go, oh, wouldn't that be so nice to have that? Um, even if you're not going to join law enforcement, are there certain things about the law you should learn? I'll, I'll jump in on that. Um, learning your local laws and your state laws is probably the best thing for you because that's what the law is. It's there to protect you. So knowing how to protect yourself, what you can and can't do on a daily basis is a really good thing. And also the Fourth Amendment, knowing the Fourth Amendment of search and seizure, um, knowing your rights there really is a big thing in this world. So taking the time to learn the Fourth Amendment and your state laws can help you stay out of trouble and know what you can and can't do as a normal citizen on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, the, uh, the easiest way to win at any game is to play by the rules, right? And so for us here in the United States, we have a certain set of governing rules, whether it's the US constitution, our state constitutions, or even all the way down to our local municipalities, our local cities with their city codes, and the more you can familiarize yourself with that set of rules, uh, the better off you will be just all the way around in anything you're, you're trying to endeavor to do uh, in life. I have another question. If someone, if you are pulled over or stopped, or and given a ticket, but you think that that, um, or so just something is happens and an officer, um, you, you think the, the officer uh, tells you you broke the law, but you think that you believe that you didn't. Um, what is the best way to go about that? Do you argue with the officer or do you um, go a different path? Um, try, even because even if you did break the law or if you didn't, it just gets a little bit murky on the streets. Is there a better way to confront the issue of you feel like you didn't actually break the law than to hash it out right there with the officer? I'll tell you what I taught my son and daughter as they were growing up, they get pulled over and they don't think they did anything wrong, sign the ticket and go to court and plead your case in court to a judge. Standing on the side of the road, you cannot argue with it's it's a mute point. You're not going to get anything out of that. I believe that every officer on here agreed with that and shook their heads. So that was unanimous. Yeah, remember, Katie, that our government, there's so many checks and balances. The, I mean, think about what the definition of what is a judge's job. A judge's job is to listen to both set of the facts and see if the rule of law was followed. And so you and the officer on the scene may, you may adamantly disagree, um, but it'll be up when you get there and you can articulate your case. And, and now so often you're good, there's going to be either patrol car camera or body camera video. And um, officers are not perfect. All of us know we're not perfect and we do make mistakes. And uh, hopefully that officer would figure that out and, and bring that to us. But you're not gonna win that day because he believes he saw what he saw or what he thought happened or she saw happened. And so um, just wait, that's what court's for. And um, 
it's not a place that most people are comfortable. Us as officers, when we first get on the job, we're not comfortable in court most of the time. And so it's understandable that citizens aren't. I would recommend if you can, um, and maybe not for a few months with the, with the, with COVID, but that you go to a courthouse one day and watch, you know, if you can, whether it be a state courthouse, um, just watch the system. Um, a trial specifically, particularly, is very interesting. And um, it's just a good experience. And, and it can be entertaining. You can see how different that is from how they do it on television. Entertaining is a good word. I have another question. Um, this might be like a stupid question, but where do you guys see yourself in five years? Like, do you guys see yourself still as a cop or like early retirement? Is that even possible to retire as a cop? It won't be early retirement, but I'll be retired in five years. Absolutely. 28 years on the job. Um, for me, um, maybe retired. My daughter's a freshman in college. So if I can get her out of college, then I think I'll, I'll be comfortable retiring. Um, I often teach at our academy. I was with trainees last week and they were finishing up and they were having this pool with them this, themselves of how much money it would take for them to go through our entire seven month academy again. And uh, the lowest one guy said he'd do it for $5,000. I told him I would start all over again tomorrow um, if I could, if that was God's plan, um, because it's an absolute blessing to have been chosen to do this job. And, uh, but I think in five years, I'll probably have it. I'll be, I'll be hanging it up. I have 20 more years, so if anybody else wants to answer. So, yeah, I, I still have it's 14 the years. the most fun you'll have, Annie. Sorry, Lieutenant, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, 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 no. My apologies. Uh, I say I, I still have 14 years left, so uh, I've got a ways to go, too. I'm at 23, so I'm not stopping. <laughs> I've got 13. And uh, so for those of us, it sounds like the majority that are going to be here for a while, uh, there's also different avenues in within the police department so we can look at to to, uh, to enjoy our, the rest of the many years that we have left. Uh, me personally, in five years, I'm hoping to either be uh, horse mounted, we have a pretty uh, great horse mounted unit, or some other specialized unit to uh, do something a little bit different. Yeah, that's um, for all for I guess there is only one person. Well, no, actually, nobody mentioned wanting to be in law enforcement, but there's a lot of really cool stuff to do in law enforcement. Um, for example, a couple of years ago, I got to run the bomb dog, which was a beautiful little black lab. And she was the cutest, sweetest thing in the world. But that was the highlight of my career in 10 years. So there's there's some cool stuff to do if you guys are thinking about it. And some of that, so you guys talk about years of service and then retirement from years of service. So is, is there a, depending on the department and, and infrastructure, whether it be federal or local or city, um, is it a certain years of service that allows you to have full retirement benefits is what you guys are trying to hit? Or is it, is it in your mind that it's an age you're trying to get to? Is it, is it certain parameters as you go through that says, you know, 28 years or, or, you know, it, is it a threshold? Is that what you guys are talking about? Um, so if, if they are entertaining or looking at it, law enforcement and understanding where where the mentality is there, right? Because um, you can love the job, but also know that there's a, a means to an end um, through the process of 20, 25 years or 30 years uh, with the badge and serving the community around you. That's a great question. And a lot of people have trouble letting go of of law enforcement. Um, we have folks that have trouble letting go. We have people routinely retire from our department on one day and go to work for the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office the next day. 
So we struggle separating ourselves from law enforcement that with the Chattanooga CPD, you can retire with a full pension after 25 years, which is, which is really good. So uh, federally it's uh, 20 years, but you have to be 50 or 25 years at uh, any age. Um, so beyond that though, um, they also make you retire federally at age 57. You can file for an extension, but they're a little bit more strict on the ages. You gotta go at 57 and you can't be hired if you're past 36, so. I can speak for the state retirement. Sergeant Haney can agree with me. Um, if you work for a county or a state agency, it's called Tennessee Consolidated Retirement System or TCRS. You can have 20 years to retire, but to get all your full benefits at the state level, you have to have 30 years. And it's a percentage of your top five years that you take home with you at the end of what they pay you out as. Yeah, in my case, I retired from the city fire department with a little over 27 years. I'd been fortunate enough to do arson for six years. So I went through the city academy. That's where I got my police credentials and really wow. enjoyed it. I was a little bit older. And then when I retired and went to UTC to get the tuition break for my son who went to school for one year and joined the army. And by then I had enough time invested. I thought, you know what, I'm enjoying this. I really enjoy interacting with students and with the faculty and staff. Um, it's not, you know, I'm not like chasing hardened criminals down dark alleys and any of that good stuff, but I, I've got six years in and I think in about four or five years, I can retire. It'll be a reduced rate, but by then I'm going to hang it up and I'm going to go fish or do something. Um, my question is uh, a very turn of the pace to what we were just talking about. Um, this is more about what to do if you witness or are a victim of the crime. Um, if you're a witness of the crime, you, not you might not necessarily um, be there when the police arrive. Um, how do you go about reporting said crime and what process would you have to go through of being a witness and or a victim of a crime? Well, there are several things you can do. Um, one of those is you can call in to the non-emergency number and let dispatch know that you had witnessed the crime and they will either get an officer in contact with you via the telephone or actually send somebody to your location to get a statement. Uh, if it's something like a car accident, what we generally try to do is get someone to fill out what's called a witness statement where they put down their vital information so we can get back in contact with them if we need to. And then they just write a brief description of what they saw and we can uh, put that with the accident report and send that in into court. As far as on the police end, most likely what will happen is, is we'll take a statement from you. We'll include that as part of our file with whatever the case is. And it may be a one-time thing or we may have to make contact with you several times, but that case file then gets passed to the DA's office and the DA will actually be in contact with you probably more often than the police department would have been. And they will be the point of contact that will uh, coordinate if there has to be a court appearance or something like that, if it's a more serious crime, and they'll let you know when to show up, where to show up, and uh, they, they'll even go over uh, maybe some, some possible questions you might face or, or something like that if you were to testify. I have another question. What do you guys think personally that your greatest weakness is? For me, it's actually difficult for me to say no. Um, the way my agency, we're always really on call and available and working with the local and the state and the city and the county officers that have become my good friends that sometimes I vacation with, that I travel with, we know each other's wives and children. Um, I say, no, we cover a 17 county area in Tennessee. 
and um, being having been done this for a long time, um, I looked the other day. I've got sixteen hundred contacts in my work phone. Those aren't Facebook friends. Those are people I really know that I've worked with. Um, I've got the phone number for a lot of them, and I'm going to have more after this. The officers that are on here. And it's hard to say no. I know that I have a short window of doing this, whether it be 20, 25, or 30 years, but um, law enforcement takes a lot from you personally because you want to be there and you want to be a servant and help the community. So in a weird way, I think that's a weakness is all of us probably give too much to this job. I feel like I want to add on that also. Um, just because I have a lot of family on this. I think that that is also my greatest weakness. Uh, I've missed a lot of birthdays, holidays over the years, and it's really hard because a lot of times they don't understand, but um, you just, you give your heart and soul to the job. <laughs> it's hard. Uh, for me, it's probably two things. One, I don't listen enough. Um, I, I do a lot of talking and I think I know a lot of things and uh, in, in doing so I can um, unknowingly kind of become dismissive of other people and I, I don't always listen like I should uh, and the other thing is is I, I just stay incredibly too busy kind of just echoing uh, what, what was already said. I think for me it's probably along with I agree with what everybody else said but also it's recognizing that I may uh, need help and asking for it. I think a lot of us are in law enforcement type A personalities and we have a lot of pride uh, that goes along with it because this is uh, a very honorable profession. But uh, I think sometimes when we need help, we might not ask for it because of, because of that pride, it gets in the way. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. If anybody has anything else they want to ask before we end. I do. Okay. What made you guys want to become a police officer? I'll start. Um, a dear friend of mine and my godfather is works for the IRS in the criminal investigations division. And from a young age, he mentored me. I saw what kind of person he was, the kind of integrity and the kind of person he was on a daily basis. And I never looked back. Age eight, I knew exactly where I was going to go. Um, got my criminal justice degree and stayed with it. I just, the way he carried himself and the way I saw <clears throat> other officers, it was, there was no different. There was nothing else for me to do. It was similar for me in college. I met some federal agents. They were FBI agents, two separate men. And I looked at them and saw who they were. And my grandparents, when I told them I was interested, they said, oh, you want to be a civil servant? And I thought, oh, that sounds awesome. Yeah, I want to serve people. I, I, I didn't want to go somewhere and make a product to make someone else money. I didn't want to sell something for the sake of, needing to make a living and the commission um the some of the uh, some of the people here will know what the book death of a salesman is. I, I read that in college and thought that sounded horrible and so for me it was wanting to serve and so I was probably 19 years old when I decided this is what I wanted to do and it took me 10 years I was 29 when I was hired by ATF You know, a lot of times we meet people on their worst day. So I know that for me, I wanted to get in it because I wanted to be that one difference that maybe could help that person that they're struggling to get through and they never can find anybody to help them. I know with probation, I ran into that a lot. Um, so that's why I kind of got into the law enforcement, the police side of it. So I could hopefully make a difference to those people so they can change and do things for the better. Um, I'm currently a probation officer, so kind of a law enforcement still, but a different side. And I was in social work for four years um, and worked in the court a lot. And I came across quite a few probation officers and saw how they really did try to help. So we tried to 
um, uphold the law for criminals that have already broken the law, um, but see them as human as much as we possibly can while they're still convicted felons and try to find that balance between helping them and making sure they're doing what they're supposed to do. So that's kind of how I ended up here and I really enjoy it. Haley, did you have a question? I thought you were raising your hand. I want to be sure we didn't skip you. Yeah, um, does something happen if you're pulled over and you don't have an ID? Are you arrested or is it just a ticket? So basically, if you don't have any identification on you, we have ways to look that up. That's not necessarily going to mean you're going to get a ticket. If you've got a good license, sometimes, I mean, I forget my wallet at home sometimes and I can get pulled over. And I just say, hey, this is my name and date of birth. And it's a very simple way to look over it. So just because you don't have it with you doesn't mean you're not going to, that doesn't mean you're going to get in trouble. Go ahead. I have a question. What are some different jobs in law enforcement? Like, Annie, I would like for you to share with them what you do. You have a cool job. Um, well, currently I work in the Real Time Intelligence Center, which is this huge room and the walls are covered with TV screens. And all of those TV screens are different cameras throughout the city. So I'm kind of like, I guess the best way to explain it is, you know how you're watching a cop movie and you see like helicopters in the big cities and they're communicating with the patrol officers like, oh, he turned right on such and such street. Well, I feel like that's kind of what we're doing, only we're not in a helicopter. We have so many cameras within the city that I can back up patrol technically and tell them so for example so so say say officer corn was my uh was a patrolman for a cpd and he pulled over a car i could get on the radio while he is making his approach and i can say officer corn i ran this tag it came back stolen also the registered driver reported it stolen on such and such date uh the suspect is a known gang member the gang member is such and such um a lot of people think we're a lot like dispatch, but we're not. Um, we we are a little bit of like the intel unit. Um, we're we're kind of like the investigators and patrols backup, if you will. It, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's really cool and it's a new thing. A lot of the really big cities have it. Um, new York City, Boston, some of the other cities have smaller in real-time intelligence centers, but Ours is actually very big. It's comparable to the big cities. And I was actually the first investigator ever, which is kind of cool. I'm, I'm excited about that. We now have three investigators that work with me and uh, it's kind of neat. And like I've already told you before, I ran the bomb dog before that. I worked patrol for 10 years. There's a lot of things you can do in law enforcement. It's just not, it's not just patrol. It's, there's a lot of cool stuff. So for uh, the United States Park Police, we have your basic patrol, we have plain clothes, we have vice. Um, if you want to fly helicopters, we'll teach you how to fly helicopters. We have aviation, we have force mounted canine, um, ID techs, those are our crime scene search people. Um, we want to ride motorcycles or traffic unit. Uh, they actually, in Washington, D.C., when you see the president go anywhere, it's uh, not only Capitol Police, but Park Police bikes with them. Um, we're responsible with uh, helping the movements for the president and a couple of other really cool things. So the, like she said, uh, investigator Kreider, beyond patrol, when you think of a police officer, you think patrol, but there's many different aspects of it. All right, I think we're almost pushing time now. Um, and obviously on this call, we have local, we have universities, we have federal. Um, there's, there's a lot of, lot of different professionals um, on this call. And, and really we wanna thank you, number one, for coming to this call and, and uh, 
um, pouring your heart into these kids and, and, and showing there's a path forward with law enforcement and um, how to be respectful both of law enforcement and um, citizens as well. Um, and that it's not always bad. There is good involved in, in law enforcement and how we proceed with that. Um, and, and obviously if um, this is recorded and hopefully with training and purposes, we'll be able to do this again in the future and have a, a larger um, kid presence and, and have some, some more maybe tailored questions, but the open forum has been beneficial. Hopefully the kids have enjoyed it as well. Um, and, and really, uh, we just appreciate your time uh, being on this call. Um, and Sandy, if you wanted to have any final words. No, just to reiterate what you said, Joe, thanking everyone for being here tonight. Um, I know that I, I think, speaking for myself, I know I greatly appreciate it. And I think that the children do and did as well. Um, I, I learned some things, so I know that they also learned some things. Um, and if any of you officers would like to keep in touch with any of the children, maybe if they have questions they didn't get to ask, um, I have some of your, well, actually I have all of your email addresses because I emailed you. If you can just let me know if it's okay, or, or I guess email me if it's not okay for them to contact you and I'll take you off the list. But if it's okay, I'll keep you on a list and I'll let them ask you questions if that's okay. Showing that you guys are human too, I think is huge because so many times when you're a teenager or a young person, you see people in authority and you put them on a pedestal where you belong, but at the same time, it makes you superhuman almost and intimidating to talk to. So I think this helped maybe break down that barrier a little bit and it can continue. Did anybody have any final thoughts before we go? No, okay. Thank you all again so much. You have a wonderful night next week for anyone, anyone, not just teens, any of you, if you wanna ever join again, we meet every Tuesday night. Teens, next week we have um, interviewing skills with Mr. Sam Turnipseed and I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. So if you wanna learn how to interview next week, same time, same place. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. And thank you again. Bye. Thank you. Bye.